Richard, thank you for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you, uh, Chris and Bix, for having me. I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. Now, you picked uh, to do this week because of this particular segment, which is the Big Rings show, February 21st, the Yokama Arena in Yokama, Japan, and n- notably known for the uh, Alexander Karela versus Akira Maeda match. And uh, why did you decide to uh, pick that, of all things? Now, that's that's kind of an off-the-wall choice uh, from some people. You know, most other people pick reasons for WWF and WCW and something like that. But this is a different choice. Yeah, I guess um, I kind of got into pro wrestling and MMA from, you know, growing up in the amateur wrestling world. And I also cover amateur wrestling. Um, so the idea of the crossover of all three that we kind of have here always was it's very interesting to me. And I think, you know, we were kind of talking off air about how this is sort of like the proto era of, you know, the internet wrestling community and the dirt sheets really getting expansive. Um, and I think that it's something that isn't really uh, looked into as deeply as it could be. And I think that you guys really go in depth and cover all aspects. So I really wanted to see your guys' take and the ability to come on and talk to you guys too was just a bonus. So really looking forward to that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's get to the section, shall we? There's a day Meltzer here with this. This is perhaps the greatest competitive wrestler who ever lived and showed the most successful. Alexander Karelin, the Russian nickname, the experiment, probably not for anything he has done himself in laboratories or food supplements he experimented with an 11 time world Greco Roman champion, three time Olympic gold medalist who hasn't been beaten in any form of competition in more than 12 years. And on his first pro wrestling event on February 21st at the Yokama Arena for Rings. In the years to come, there will likely be more written about Maeda versus Corellan on the show at the Yokama Arena than any match within pro wrestling this year. Well, <laughs> I don't know about that, Dave. <laughs> I, th- I think um, the big picture, no, I've, probably not. There's really not a whole lot written about this match over time. But we'll talk about why he probably thought that way. Although, uh... yeah. Friend of the show, Sean Wheelock, did write something about it for his uh, worker shoot column that he's doing now on the Observer website. Yeah, but it's not as big as he thought it was going to be. It's with that one. No, but you can see why he did. Well, yeah, we're about to get into it. Well, the ma- the I mean, do you think that part? Of- Sorry, I was just going to say, do you oh. think that part of that is the death of rings and the fact that not only the promotion's gone, but that style isn't really a thing anymore, that it's sort of just forgotten? Uh, maybe, maybe. Um, I think the fact that real MMA became as huge as it did, you know, like the UFC and, and Pride and all that stuff, that probably made the biggest difference of all. Yeah. Because once once that stuff got out there, who cares about rings? Although you know? rings is in its most transitional period at this point. True. Not just in terms of Maeda retiring, but also as far as going from work to shoot and trying to figure out rule changes and stuff, because it's 2000, I believe, when they have the famous King of Kings tournament that, you know, really kind of sends everyone on their way to pride. Yes. The match is not only notable because it was the debut of the most successful competitive wrestler ever lived in pro wrestling, but because it bridged three different worlds together, pro wrestling, amateur wrestling, and martial arts. And after the fact, because of endless speculation, it has and will no doubt continue to transpire over what it exactly was, perhaps for years, given the amount of coverage she has been received in Japan thus far. In addition, Japan, far more than the U.S., is in the long-term historical sports perspective when it comes to pro wrestling. And the U.S. is more so probably where history is generally forgotten after the next episode of the television show. There are things known about the match. Corellin, 31, won the decision by a 2-1 point score of a Maeda in a 2 Five minute round match. Maeda, 39, a pro wrestling legend in Japan who retired before Pat Tass in the same arena in July, came out of retirement for the main event of this show, the biggest in history for rings, before shout out 17,048 fans, paying an estimated $2,479,000, which probably rivals only the Muhammad Ali Antonio Inoki match in 1976 as the largest gate for a traditional arena as opposed to a dome stadium in the history of pro wrestling. That's a hell of a gate. <laughs> I mean, they could have probably done a bigger building in retrospect. Um, I don't know. I don't know if a dome would have been the right setting, but they could have done a bigger building. 
So yeah, they kind of maybe underestimated the power of this match. Maybe I don't know. But I guess Yokohama was the thing because that was where Maeda retired. Yeah, I, if they were going to do it anywhere else, where? Jingu Stadium, maybe? It could, but there are other big buildings in Japan that aren't traditional pro wrestling venues, too. So, who knows? Where is the promotion, like, uh, in general right now? Like, is it a hot product, or is it starting to fade? Because I always thought that... When Maeda was going out, people kind of thought the promotion might go with him. So it was really cooling off until this match happened. Well, Rings had a, a great 98. Uh, probably the, the greatest match in the history of promotion was in 98. And Kasaka and Tamara. But um, that, that's in ring. That's not necessarily business-wise. True. Um, they're still doing Strong House at the Budokan. So, I mean, they were successful in Tokyo, no doubt. But that's Maeda. I mean, Tokyo was Maeda country. So it made a difference when he wasn't there. Yes, they were they were trying to replace him, for sure. The match was considered a major success, but financial for the company, which has been struggling the gates since Maeda's retirement due to his top two remaining stars, Yoshi Tamara and Shoshi Kasaka, despite their talent not breaking through and becoming pros and drawing cards. But there's the answer to your question. The appearance of Corella and garnered incredible publicity, both within the wrestling and martial arts world of Japan, but also the top sports story. It's received major coverage in every network sports segment and got six full pages of coverage the next day in Tokyo Sports. Unprecedented for pro wrestling in years. The question among insiders going to the match and still coming out of it was what exactly was the match? Apparently, this has become a hotly debated issue among wrestling fans on the internet in Japan as to whether this was a shoot or work match. We should have complete review of the show for videotape hopefully by next week, if not the week after. Well, guess what? We will. The general consensus among those their live was it was a shoot match, but perhaps we've agreed upon stipulations before, and which is not unusual for shoot matches in that org. Unless limiting some form of striking, there's natural skepticism due to Maeda's background. Reports from those live indicate the match had no holes. Spots and work shoots were because notice whether the combatants are working together, which would be almost impossible in the works. Is made and numerous work shoots has never had a match without holes against far more experienced workers. Only the very best ring work, rings workers, a category Maeda doesn't fit into against one another, can do a work match without holes. If this truly didn't have any holes, it is ridiculous to believe Corella never having done this match, but could have done this before could pull off a work that would be believable, especially since he wasn't in the country long enough to practice it out ahead of time, which is common practice in work matches with people who have never done this before. That doesn't rule out a shoot with one person carrying the other to the time limit instead of working to finish them, although Gorellin would probably not be experienced enough at that aspect of holding back a competition without that also becoming evident watching the match. After viewing tape of the show, it is not easily clear, which will no doubt make the debate on what it was that much more vociferous. Gorellin is a freak. He came in 295 pounds and was ripped with a strength generated in particular in his low back and thighs. He did have the bloated denseness of a steroid user. It was almost light and sinewy in his build, yet still weighed 295, which is where the freak initial, the big head and big hands comes in. I wouldn't try and insult anyone's intelligence just by using the fact he's never failed a steroid test in sports as evidence of anything as announced or done over the past three Olympic Games, particularly for a man whose nickname at one point was The Experiment. Well, there are no, no doubt plenty of weightlifters who can do push more. be many if anyone in the world who could outpower him in man on man strength which has been evident for more than a decade as he's gone unbeaten and almost untouched in Greco-Roman wrestling. None of that has much to do with the big question. Yeah, Corellin's a guy who he, nobody talks about him anymore, but he was a legend in amateur wrestling, Richard, in the 90s. I mean, again, been the three Olympics. I mean, just total dominance through all those years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was in the middle of his run. Well, I guess towards the end of the run, because it's, he doesn't lose until he runs into Roland Gardner in 2000. But, um, I mean, it's true. People don't really talk about him stateside. But in Russia, he's still a very big deal in wrestling. Um, he actually is the mentor of a guy who's on the Olympic team now, Roman Vlasov. And uh, they bring him out for all the national championships and the world championships. He's in the corner and stuff. So he's he is sort of a folk hero to the people of Siberia up there. And Bix, the question I have on Corellin is: You think if Corellin was in, you know, in his prime, 
say five years later that he would have been wooed by UFC or pride or one of the major or K one, one of the major MMA groups to come in. And that w- then he would have become like this humongous megastar then. I don't know, because if you think about the Russians who end up making it big in MMA, even in that era with guys like Fedor, they're not your big Russian state sponsored athletes. You know, we don't yeah. have any. I mean, I can't. I mean, Richard might know better. Like, do we have were there any like high level, like big name a- Russian amateur wrestlers or Russian ju- judicas or even. I mean, really, it's just the the Sambo guys who really were any kind of high level that crossed over, right? Right, yeah. It seemed to just be Sambo guys or people who came over through rings. So maybe that would be a connection, but it is too late in his career for that. And also getting at the, uh, getting at the state-sponsored aspect, I did find a Sports Illustrated article on Corellin from 1991. And in the article, it talks about he's already receiving a salary and has two cars and a point it's probably even more of a financial incentive to not go into mma yeah i mean the thing is corellans also becomes huge at the time when russia is not seen as what they were in the 70s and 80s um they weren't the evil russia at this point in time right this is post-soviet pre-putin exactly so I think that's another thing too. I think if, if Corellin had been around in the eighties or after, you know, in the, in, in the other eras, he would have probably been a bit bigger name then because he would have had that whole aspect of this big anti American sentiment, well, anti Russian sentiment, excuse me, against him. So yeah, it's just interesting to think about how 20, you know, 20 years ago, Corellin was this huge deal. And of course the Rulon Gardner thing was gigantic a year later. But again, it's just something that's kind of not talked about anymore, yeah. unless and, you're in, the, in, in that circle, you know. Right. Um, and Bix mentioned the Wheelock article. He talks about how um, Art Davy tried to track down Corellin to try to get him in an early UFC, but he just couldn't get through the Soviet program or whatever to find him. So um, he at least claims to be a, to be interested in him at the time. Well, I, I, no doubt. I would be, too. I'd be trying my best to get him. Well, and also, huge remember, in spite of what people think about those early UFCs, even though they were friends and business partners, partners, Art Davey was not in it to push Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. No. He was trying to recruit the best guys. The problem was that in a lot of disciplines, the best guys had no desire to do this. Exactly. All right, Dave, is this skeptical of the legitimacy of the match? The match had great intensity, and no matter what it was, it was a huge success both financially and as, and as an event and a spectacle for the market it played to. It will be remembered in a positive light by everyone except for those who considered nothing but its legitimacy and the fact Corellum was involved in the work. Of course, that's what comes to live on. This is largely those who see rings as an offshoot of pro wrestling. But those looking at it from the other two worlds, amateur wrestling, which doesn't do works, and martial arts, on the sport, the framework of judging this would be different. The two did not stand each making it appear to be legitimate for 10 minutes, which is difficult. Corellin had definitely never worked a match before. Although he did throw people around in what was called an exhibition in 1989 in New Japan show at Tokyo Sumo Hall. Imagine him in New Japan in the 90s, huh? It was believable enough that people who wanted to believe wouldn't be disappointed. And apparently the Japanese media covered it as it was legitimate. And received tremendous mainstream sports coverage, but there were holes and it was ultimately more a pro wrestling match than a competitive mixed martial arts match. First, it appeared Corellin gave Maeda his leg in the first round and waited for Maeda to put the ankle lock on him and then grab the ropes for a point. The way Maeda got the leg with an ankle pick and the way the move was set up didn't seem believable, given Corellin's skill levels. Although he was a Soviet military champion and Sambo was a teenager, the hesitation in Corellin's reactions waiting for the move appeared to give away. Second round began with what looked to be a high spot. Maeda took Corellin down and got his back went for a choke. Corellin quickly reversed it and got a cranking headlock for a rope break point in the first 25 seconds. If one can argue that things shouldn't happen, can happen, can explain the first point, because world-class wrestlers have been surprised to take an MMA match before, although never a wrestler Corellin's credentials by a man pushing 40 like Maeda, the second point kills the arguments. 
There's no way Maeda could clean it down Corellin twice. There's certainly no way in the manner he did in the second round. Where it gets weird is that everything from that point forward looked pretty legit. Although there were holes, if you look for them close to where Corellin seemed to ease off the pressure. But other times, he appeared to be trying to bend Maeda in a very painful position with his freak of strength. If someone were to argue that they agreed to give each other one spot and it was legit from there, it would be an arguable case, although that probably wasn't what it was either. It did appear Corellin was trying to fish Maeda with submissions the entire second round as opposed to laying on him and carrying him for time, as we've seen when guys have carried other guys for him in otherwise legitimate pack race matches. The crowd intensity was tremendous from Maeda's spurts of offense, which gave the match an authentic sports feel since Corellin couldn't block leg kicks and Maeda can throw them. Could throw them. Late in the first round, when Corellin did his Corellin left, it appeared he was taking something off the impact of the slam, but he was so powerful, and John, the John to Maeda was, while landing was still devastating. Dave had no doubt Maeda took tremendous legitimate punishment over the course of the match, remember, for in a positive way. It will be one of the two defining moments of his career, even though he lost. All right, Richard, um, your thoughts on Dave's opinions of how the match was worked. Um, do you agree with the consensus of what he said, or do you think that uh, he may have been a little off base? Well, one of my favorite things about reading The Old Observers and this show is Dave's trying to figure out whether something's a work or not, because in <laughs> retrospect, a lot of the times it just seems so ridiculous knowing what we know now. Um, initially, when I first watched this, I had to immediately think it was a work and I watched it a couple times getting ready for the show. And I have, if someone said that they worked the first round and then the second round, they were kind of going for it, I might buy it. Because I think there are some points in the second round where Corellin is on top and sort of mashing on Maeda's head or working an arm. But um, I, I think overall it's probably a work start to finish. Yeah. I mean, I, I never really watched this match. Um, so... But, I mean, I, the consensus I remember reading at the time from people that w- were in the know, they all believed it was war. Yeah. Now, I've been watching it as we've been recording now. What it comes off like to me is a work where both guys ca- are kind of having fun letting the other try them at times. I think that's a fair yeah, estimation. Because there are moments where things look like they get very legit all of a sudden like there there's in the first round i i don't remember even what led up to it but they're in a clinch and corellin just whips him down out of nowhere yeah he has like a front headlock on him and he looks like he's kind of holding the position and maybe and then maeda kind of reaches for his leg and he completely just flips him over and whips him down (laughs) yeah so there's that Maeda does look like he's throwing the early low kicks pretty damn hard. Um, it wouldn't shock me if they, you know, were like, "Hey, if I, well, you, if I, if you know, if I let you give, no, excuse me, if you let me take your back, if I get the choke, then I get the choke, or something like that. Even like some kind of arrangement there wouldn't even be that shocking, although." I know Maeda had humbled to a degree in rings. I don't know if the Russians just didn't know his reputation or what. It is kind of surprising that they would let him get any kind of agreed upon vulnerable position on Corella. Yeah, and I went through it because I, I do side work for Fight Metric. I went through and counted up, and uh, I had Corella only landing one strike in the whole fight, and 24 for my. It'd be surprising if they made a rule or something that you could just kick and then, but even then, I mean, that's what Maeda has had success for when he shot on people in the past. So I don't know if that's the best idea either. Well, here's my thing on the whole thing anyway, regarding whether it's a work or shoot. Does it really matter? <laughs> I mean, does it really matter in the end whether or not this was a work or a shoot considering where it was at in rings, you know, rings is, Rings was a pro wrestling promotion. And even when they did shoots, they used a very different rule set that some guys like Valentine Overeem were much better at than they were at MMA. Yes. And also, if you look at it from the perspective, even today, MMA promoters, 
pro wrestling promoters. The fans are thoroughly involved in this match because Maeda's a legend and Corellan's a legend in his own sport. The match itself is actually kind of boring and dull at points, but the fans are completely into it and completely obsessed. And we see this with some of the other uh, fights or matches on this card, too. If you have the fan involvement and the fan investment, then you can get away with maybe a couple holes, as Dave describes, and people might still think it's a, a shoot. Yeah. But, and- but, but see, that's the thing. Like I said, it's rings. You know, this is... This isn't a promotion that's really passing themselves off as legitimate sport. I mean, know? yes and no. I mean, originally the idea was that Rings was presenting itself as the most divorced from pro wrestling of the UWF offshoots. You know, that's why they didn't use any existing pro wrestlers other than Maeda. Tamara? Until, well, until Tamara came in. That was later. <laughs> And even then, Tamar was only a shoot style guy. He was not a traditional pro wrestler in that sense. But yeah, I mean, still though, <sighs> he's probably the best shooter in the promotion's history too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the thing. I mean, it, it, uh, in Japan, they can get definitely get away with it. Oh, yeah. Even more than anywhere else, you know. They kind of, I mean, they want to believe it's a shoot. But I think they know it's not. Yeah. And you probably, and they probably thought prior I was that way for years. Well, Even in non shoot, non works. Well, also, something that I. I mean, you know? I don't think she'd be glossed over, and I think Dave kind of did. If, if Corellan actually had a fairly decent level Sambo background, that makes him much better prepared for even a semi legitimate MMA situation than you would think than if he was just an incredibly high-level Greco-Roman wrestler. Yes. And because, you know, both interna- main international styles of wrestling are not heavy on mat work, even. You know what I mean? It You know, it's mainly the upper body throws in Greco and the lower body takedowns in freestyle. And what people think of as actually having, you know, a lot of actual ground grappling is, you know, American collegiate wrestling. But, you know, you look at, like, the second round where he's just smothering Maeda from the top the whole time. Like, if you didn't know he had Sambo experience, you would you could even argue that made it seem work because that's not really his wheelhouse. But knowing that he does actually have decent, you know, on the floor grappling experience, I mean, it's it's clearly a work, but I I think I think they're having fun. And I think they're they're giving each other little chances at different times. Yeah, it's not, I mean it, again, it, it, who cares? Really, who cares? All right. After the match, Corellan said he was tense and uneasy about fighting this style for the first time. He said he was lucky to be near the Russell Maeda got his ankle, or he would have had the tap. He said his strategy was to wear Maeda down the first round and go for a finish in the second round, but that he got tired faster than expected and couldn't finish Maeda. Although Maeda appeared to be more tired than Corellan. He said he was satisfied with a win in his first match under these rules. I suffered some damage from the leg kicks, which concerned him because he's competing in the Russian National Championships next week and the Worlds in June. He said he wouldn't return to the rings anytime in the near future, and he didn't. He said he continued to fight his style, but he got to train for the sport. And at this point, his training is geared toward winning a fourth gold medal in 2000 Olympics in Sydney, Australia. Good luck with that. He hinted that he would consider returning at the Olympics. Good luck with that, too. As a an event, the final, name of the show, was a good mix of styles and a successful event attempting to attract new fans to the company through the mainstream curiosity of the main event. Whether Kyoshi Tamura, who avenged his most devastating of his, of his career, although it was a work win to avenge a shoot loss. Okay. This is where Reigns gets confusing everyone because you never know exactly what it is until it takes place. And even then, sometimes you don't really know. Well, don't even speculate. Tamura put on a great performance in the semifinal in this win. Will Tamara be able to keep some of the curious fans interested in rings is a question that answers the company's future. <laughs> Again, why even speculate if you don't know? This is automatically assume it's a work. <laughs> so according to Dave, the previous Tamara fight was a shoot. Exactly. And it's actually pretty funny because on Sherdog, they have this fight on his record, and the first fight is not on the record. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows. The only people I know were the guys in the ring and the promotion. That's it. You know? And to be honest with you, you can say that about any combat sport match, really. 
there's been plenty of Boston matches that were works. There's been plenty of MMA matches that have been works, but nobody knows it. Well, you know who the real secret keeper probably is, especially for ranks. Who's that? Chris Stoltman. <laughs> Not the football player. No, but he was one of the top foreigners for years. He was the for- he was the foreign booker. He also booked guys into Pancrase, which is a thing that's not that well known. And I gotta think he's he's in on everything. Well, um, yeah, he's office. Yeah, <laughs> of course. All right. Let's go. Dave watched the whole show. So now we got Dave's rundown like we do a normal pay per view show. Yes, he's on Namakawa, beat Ruki Yama by one no score after a 20 time, minute time on the Aspire. The only point was Yama getting a yellow card eight minutes, 30 seconds in. It wasn't even clear what for. It was a real good shoot match on the ring's rules. A lot of good standing exchanges when Namakawa getting the better of it. Namakawa actually tried a Baba style high. <laughs> This Have you seen hilarious. this, Chris? Have you this seen is, this? this is, I'm just reading this is hilarious because he, he's talking about these pro wrestling spots in a shoot. There's like a referee stoppage, and the referee separates him, and then when the yeah. referee says fight, the guy just flies in like <laughs> with the Baba kick. It's pretty funny. <laughs> As the match went on, Nemakawa tired, and Yama in his debut match nearly got him twice with chokes. Yama's typical 180 pound Japanese shoot fighter with endless stamina and a lot of skill. Bad man for the other card, this would have been a very difficult decision. And, of course, Uyama became a name in the uh, mid-2000s uh, with a new style. Tamara's a uh, wrestling promotion. So, uh, yeah, well, I mean, what's going on here? Uh, I mean, <laughs> again, talking about pro wrestling spots in shoes. <laughs> well, I mean, this this really seemed like a shoot. They really slap each other a lot in the screen. <laughs> Well, and remember, I mean, it depends on circumstances, but Sakuraba would try to do pro wrestling spots in shoots he was dominating. Yeah, but even some of those have been questioned, too, now. So, you know, which one? I've seen people in recent time question uh, some of the Gracie matches. So do you realize how much they would have had to pay them off to get them to do jobs? (laughs) I don't know anything. And I haven't heard anything, but if you watch the Vitor fight, it looks like Vitor quits or something. I don't but know it's if that's Vitor, Vitor that's what Vitor. he does. Right, yeah. <laughs> but it looks kind of sketchy, I'm not gonna lie. But again, all right. So Dave has said this match was a shoot. Let's just move on. All right. You'll see Yamamoto beat Andre Kopolov at six fifty five. This was a work match. And it turned out to be pretty good for the style, with good holes and switches on both sides. The score was tied 3-3 three to three before Yamamoto caught him with a choke in the middle and Kopolov struggled before tapping. Two and a half stars. Well, they're both pro wrestlers! <laughs> this Kopolov guy looks like the Russian George Costanza. And <laughs> in the walkout, like, when he's right before he walks out, they put the camera on him backstage. And he spends a good, like, 30 seconds rubbing himself in the face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Kopolov was from the ring stuff I've seen. He was he was pretty good, and then Yamamoto was a uh, a guy who you know he was good too. Uh, but you know it is what it is. All right, the legend Volkan beat Nikolai Zuev in four forty nine with a combination half crab using his legs instead of his arms for the crab and using his arms for a face lock. It was a very good work match, particularly Han doing his great mat working submissions two or three quarter stars. I was fully prepared to make fun of Dave for his description of this submission. Um, but then I found the video and I have to say it is rather odd. He sets up like he's going to do a calf slicer. And instead of grabbing the foot with his hand, hands, he steps over with his other foot and, and catches the, the laces. And then he, he kind of dives his upper body across the other guy's body and grabs his head like a twist. So um, it is a very strange submission. I wouldn't really call it a crab with the legs instead of the arms like Dave does, but it is a very, very odd thing to say for sure. And Volkan, I mean, the guy, like I said, the legend. I mean, the guy has so many great matches in rings, and that's all he all he did, basically, was rings. And he's a guy who not many people have really seen a lot of his stuff, but you need to go check check him out. I mean, even if you're not really a fan of the style, if you enjoy guys doing submissions, then Volkan is your guy. Yes, Volkan is the Lucha Libre maestro 
style worker of rings. Absolutely. He is the Negro Navarro of rings. And a lot of that stuff is online. It is easy to find. Absolutely. Yeah. If you wanted to show someone, I always thought Volkan, if you wanted to show someone that shoot style, he's the guy you would show him. Um, I was going to ask you guys about this. Last year, or two years ago, I guess, there was a big campaign about him possibly getting into the Observer Hall of Fame. Where do you guys stand on that? I mean, like you said, he's mostly in rings. Not a lot of people have seen it. So He was a good draw, though, too. That's the thing. Yeah, but uh, my thing is uh, uh, there wasn't enough there because he didn't have that many matches, you know? I mean, he only had, what, 40 matches total in his whole career? It's does not that, a lot. Th- th- Does that make a Hall of Fame guy? I just don't think so. I really don't think so. I can't put somebody in the Hall of Fame just 40 matches. I'm so sorry. Not in a wrestling Hall of Fame. MMA Hall of Fame or something like that? Or some type of combat sports Hall of Fame? Yeah, maybe. But not, not wrestling. Well, let me ask you this. Obviously, it changes the whole thing, but if your guys who are in the Hall of Fame mainly for their shoot style contributions, if they do not really have much in the way of a career before the shoot style promotion, are they Hall of Famers? Like, if not Takata, to, not in my eyes. you know what I'm saying? If Takata is not one of the best wrestlers in the world, bef- you know, in New Japan, on and off for several years, is he? But UW, he's UWFI not is for wrestling, though, too. No, I know, but. Does or if we, Maeda did not have yeah. more of a pro wrestling here. No, but you're talking about the the amount of matches is my point. Because the other shoot style guys weren't having a lot of matches either. What well, you gotta bring me bring me an example of somebody. Who? So I was saying, like No, bring me an example of somebody that was more like Vulcan, not a pro wrestler. No, that's well, my point though, because there are the Vulcan is the only one that really has that uh, that kind of candidacy. Sakuraba? He's in there. But Sakura, Sakuraba's in there really for what he did in MMA, and then they split up the Hall of Fame voting. And stuff. Well, I know, but still, you know, Sakuraba had less fights than matches than Volkan did, as far as in that in that world, that world of MMA and whatever you want. I mean, he worked in MMA or whatever. And as far as wrestling career, he was you know an undercard guy. Sure. So, I know I know he's not in. But um, someone that I've heard you guys talk, I believe one guest kind of brought it up as a counterpoint to Brock Lesnar and saying Bob Sapp. Yeah, well, you know, Bob Sapp's not a Hall of Famer either. <laughs> right, yeah, so that kind of makes the point, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, Volkan, if, if we're talking about work, then Volkan was one of the best workers of his era, for sure, for sure. But there's just not the depth, you know, to me, in my eyes. That's why I never voted for him. It's not the death. So, I get I it. And I, I, he fell off the ballot, didn't he? Tamara, Tamara's the same kind of way. But Tamara also had you know, FI, you know, and he had, I don't know. It's kind of different in a way, I guess. He had, you know, new style. He had, he had all kind of stuff on his resume. It wasn't just straight rings. He had pride, you know, I don't know. And by the way, for the record, including the actual shoots, Wrestling Data has 65 Volcon matches. Okay. And given Ring's results are pretty complete, I gotta think that's basically everything. Okay. Alright. Uh, Sean Alvarez beat Wataru Sakata by decision in 20 minutes in a Valley Tudo match. Wataru Sakata's 195 is a little like a cross between Mark Coleman and Scott Steiner. This was a shoot under Valley Tudo rules, basically similar to USC, but without stand-ups. So the match could continue forever, stalled on the ground as it did, but really boring. The fans still were into it anyway. Alvarez uh, took him down immediately, but never wants to try to do anything, but get the position and hold him down. He got side control in the full mount, but still did nothing on offense, but hold his position until 15-50 when Sakata finally got away. But it's with nuts at this point. Sakata got a momentary takedown, but Alvarez quickly reversed it and was caught in the guard. And there they stayed until time expired. Sakata was working for his submissions in the final moments for the bottom, as it, and if there had been no time limit, may eventually won. After the match ended, Sakata got up and complained that Alvarez was doing something illegal. The people ain't joints. He kicked him in the chest, and then went ringside, pulled them apart. So uh, Sakata's a guy who would become a pro wrestling guy in the 2000s as well, working zero one one and what have you. Uh, but Richard, what was your thoughts on this? Was it as chaotic as Dave was saying here? 
I think it kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier about the promotion because this fight is sort of chaotic and exciting, like he says, but mostly it's uh, Sakata desperately diving for takedowns and getting sprawled on. Alvarez was a guy who was a, I think he was a Henzo Gracie guy, and he had a bunch of success at Abu Dhabi. And when I first got into MMA, like 2002, 2001, there was a lot of hype that he was going to come into the UFC. And then he got beat up by Cabbage in like two rounds. And that was pretty much the end. So, um, but it's a very exciting fight because the crowd is really into it, and I think that that kind of makes it. Without the crowd supporting it, it might be a real stinker. Yeah, that helps out for sure. And and also this kind of we talked about the shoot versus work. I mean, in this this fight, they're wearing gloves, and it's definitely more. It has a different feel than the other fights, and I think that sometimes when you have both on the same card, it's just kind of bizarre. So, so you definitely got more of the shoot feel from this one. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're on the ground for a long time. There's not a lot of rolling for submissions. You know, there's punching on the ground. Like, it, it definitely seems more like a shoot. And see, Bix is what blurs the lines and all this stuff. When you have matches that are shoots and matches that are works on the same show. Yes. And try to and present them as the same thing. And one of the good ways to tell, like Richard was saying, is if there are extended periods on the ground and they are somewhat stalemated, it's much more likely that it's a shoot. Because, I mean, granted, they did it at a more fast pace in UWFI and the more straight-up UWF-style promotion, but the idea in shoot style is that you're just kind of rolling, not defending. Yeah. So if you're defending, it's much more likely it's a shoot. Yeah. All right, next match. We called him the Mutant Marais. Did I say the last name, Ryan? I can't remember. I think so. All right. Be here at Mitsu Kanahara by decision after 20 minutes. The Mutant is six foot eight, three quarters, 279 pounds, and ripped. But looking far more artificial than Corellin. Kanahara is five foot six and weighs 211. So there's another size mismatch. You pretty well got the idea that Rings booked this Japanese fighter these ridiculous size mismatch matches. So if they lose, it's okay because they were fighting someone much bigger. And if they were to the win, it would get them over big. Mutant got behind him and then wound up on top, but caught the guard. He punched from the top and was more aggressive than Alvarez. Kind of hard was far more skilled, but giving away far too much size. And he couldn't stand with the bigger man because of the incredible reach difference. Nor could he take him down, so he wound up being a lot of leather. Kind of hard escaped a few times to try an ankle pick takedown, so he couldn't get them and was caught underneath every time. Even when the mutant got behind Kind of hard, he never worked for a choke. He punched Kind of hard, who would turn his back. Kind of hard got a moment. Material just was easily had his eye pretty swollen up by the end of the match. Not much happened, but people were into the drama of it. You, um, yeah, Dave brings up the point here where the Japanese guys are finding these much bigger dudes. Do you agree with that sentiment, Richard? That that's what they were doing here with the, the matchups? I think so. I mean, like I said, Alvarez was very muscled up, uh, kind of looked like a poor man's Jeff Munson. And here, Marias, I mean, Marias looks huge in this fight, even bigger than he did in Pride. Uh, where is. Where is Kanahara on the totem pole in rings at this point? <clears throat> he's like on that level below Tamara. Okay. He's he's uh he's like the he's like uh, if Tamara Kasaka the top guys he's like the upper mid card. So yeah, that's that'd be where I pretty much replace him at. Because uh, yeah, I, I remember when he came into Pride later, and I was just kind of like, I know he's from rings, but I know he wasn't one of the top guys in rings, so it was kind of interesting. I always wondered that. Yeah, Bix, where, where do you stand on uh, Kanahara? Just as a worker? Yeah, just period, yeah. He was fine. Um, he was definitely very good, but I don't, I, I don't think he ever really, like, super impressed me with anything. Yeah. Yeah, he was, uh, he was a technically, he was technically good, yeah, like you said, and he was a guy they could put in there, but he wasn't somebody you would consider as, like, the, the guy who could be a main eventer. All right, time. and it wasn't like with Sakata, Naruse, or Nagai, where he had this amazing, you know, in ring, post ring, traditional pro wrestling career. Either. No, he didn't. You know, he, he never did. Really, he didn't. He didn't. He didn't go into traditional pro wrestling. He just faded away. Or when when the regular MMA stuff, basically. Which is actually kind of weird because when you think about it, that most of the natives did something after they either did regular pro wrestling or they tried MMA. Yeah, and he did try MMA, but, you know, it just wasn't, not, wasn't much of anything to it, you know? Yeah, I looked up his record here. He 
fought until 2013, and he finished up with a 19-27 and five record. Yeah, there you go. He basically was a job guy in the end. All right, semifinal here. Give time to beat Valentin Overeem. It's only one year later. The rematch. Overeem's upset in the shoot last year. Rings they made the same mistake. If this was a work, but one of the stuff work. Overeem was six three down to one ninety three. He was two twenty last year, and looked skinny. It appeared Overeem actually knocked Tamara out and momentarily with a palm palm heel. Tamara's mat work on the ground was out of this world. His quick spinning moves and submission it made more impressive because he was working with a guy with virtually no experience doing works. Overeem put Tamara down for the second time with a kick at a knee, and it appeared the knee knocked Tamara's tooth out. The Tamara kept feeling for the missing tooth. Overeem got a half crab, but Tamara escaped and turned to armbar for submission. Three and a half stars. Well, if he went for a half crab, you know it's a work. <laughs> there you go. D- Dave says it's obviously a work, and then he says the Tamara gets knocked down twice and loses a tooth. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, what is going on here? Well, you notice here. Here's what you here's what you notice. You notice some matches have star ratings and some don't, and the ones that have star ratings are the ones he thinks it works. Right, yeah. Because he doesn't rate uh, MMA fights. Exactly. Again, so weird on this whole report. But right. um, go ahead and talk about this match. Uh, Tamara's Redemption, Richard. I think that Tamara's biggest gift to the shoot style was his ability to work with non-pro wrestlers and make it look seamless. If this is a shoot, which I think it is, because like they, uh, like Bick says, he goes for half crab. Um, but you it mean, does. You, you mean work? Good. You... Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, work. My mistake. Yeah, this is a work. But um, it, you know, it is, and I think he makes it look very good and it's seamless, and it's it's the pinnacle of the form, in my opinion. Yeah, big any thoughts? I I I'm actually surprised when you think about when I really think about that they're doing half crabs on rings. <laughs> it is pretty late for that. I mean, the promotion's been around for eight years. That's that's a bit odd to do such a work. Yeah. Well, somebody told him probably to do it, so he probably well, come up with that. On- Vaida was a New Japan Young Lion. Yeah, and the main event: Corona over Maeda, two one score, two five minute rounds. Maeda came in two fifty seven. It was the best shape he made in years. But the story of him being two hundred eighty five with five percent body fat were joke. I thought his body fat would have been below fifteen percent. The match was a lot better than you think. And part of that was due to the crowd heat because Corella just looked like a more powerful version of the typical lost huge European amateur wrestler that's brought in for this group. Two and a quarter stars. What does Dave mean when he says lost huge amateur wrestler? He means lost in the ring because they yeah, uh, okay. don't, know, don't, don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Because they brought in just like giant Russian dudes and threw them in there. Oh, yeah. Well, they brought in a lot of guys, you know, European guys. That was their thing. Because they weren't bringing Americans in, you know? It was Dutch and Russian dudes. Dutch and Russians, yep. How, how would you remember this whole thing, Richard? Uh, is there something that will, you know, should be, you know, talked about, like Dave said, as being one of the, the, the biggest things of 1999? Or uh, do you think maybe it was overrated? I think that it was probably more of the moment than it'll be remembered. Um, I think there really, you know, we've talked about this earlier and it's kind of a common thing to say now that the whole shoot style is really not really a thing anymore and there's not really an audience for it. And I think that that really hurts it historically. But, um, you know, there was definitely an interest. And I think that pro wrestling at its best is inclusive of the but sort of like the sporting fan. And I think that it, in a lot of ways, pro wrestling has moved past that. But some people still like to see the crossover. And when we see like Scott Norton fighting uh, Peter Ertz in Enochiasm, you know, some people get excited, but other people would rather just that stuff go away. So, <laughs> <laughs> Bix, your thoughts? See, that's the type of thing that really would have bugged me in like 2003. But now, maybe in your, in our like, modern indie WrestleMania weekend mindset. I hear Scott Norton v- versus Peter Ertz, and I kind of want to see it. Right. It's almost like a hipstery kind of thing now, whereas before it was ruining wrestling. Yeah, pretty much. And uh, time, times have changed. Attitudes have changed. Um, it's a different, it's a different era. And that's the thing, you know, that, and that's why things are what they are. So absolutely. 
All right, Richard, um, let you plug some stuff here, whatever you got to plug. So uh, go ahead and start plugging. Well, yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Richard A. Mann, M-A-N-N, two N's in man. Um, I do a ESPN.com preview for all UFC events using fight metric stats. And I do a weekly preview of uh, big time college wrestling matches for intermatwrestle.com. Um, but I link everything up on my Twitter. So if you want to follow me there, you can read all my stuff. Absolutely, sir. And I, 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 I do. I love listening to it. I learn a lot from it, and I was happy to uh, do this guest, though.